Welcome to The Great Podcast, the show where we take a look at the important men and women of history and decide once and for all if they are worth all the fuss. My name is Jordan. And my name's David. Welcome. We're going to hop right into this one. First to- try. Yeah, yep, first try for sure. I wasn't going to say anything. Nailed it. Uh, we need to start talking quickly, though, because this script is about 10 pages longer than the rest. Oh. So, let's Settle begin. down, grab your popcorn and your energy drinks. Imagine, if you will, a densely wooded area. A low fog hangs over a large clearing in the trees. Soldiers move about the clearing, moving bodies toward the burn pits. The landscape is wounded by a recent battle. Large stones lay in places they ought not to. Trails etched into the ground, marking their previous trajectory and velocity. Some of these trails are marked with blood and viscera. The Romans have earned themselves a victory in this uh, God's forsaken place, but none are joyous. They move about their work like half-dead men, as many of them are. One soldier spent the last few nights with a fever, and he would shake at times. He was exhausted, to say the least. Still, he was a soldier of the legions, and he would do his duty. He dragged the latest corpse across the field to the massive pyre the engineers had constructed. As he does so, he can't help but notice the strange lesions on the dead man's skin. There were no wounds from battle. They looked like large bumps, some of which had burst and scarred over. The man tossed the corpse onto the pile, unnerved, but too drained to think much about it. Until he looked down and noticed something. There on his hand were these same small bumps. <sighs> he felt around his exposed skin and found, to his horror, his body was covered in what would soon be his death. No. Yeah. So, today, we're going to be looking at three emperors, which is why this one's so long. Oh boy. Um, our primary focus will be the one and only... Marcus Aurelius. Hey, that's a name that stands out. It sure is. It's a pretty popular one. Um, If you've seen the movie Gladiator, you will know Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a very fictional version of the end of his reign. (laughs) Uh, But there's some truth to it, so we'll discuss that as we go. Um, His story is closely in time with the other two emperors we're going to talk about today. Three if you count Hadrian, but he's kind of less important. We've already talked about him. Mm -hmm, So mm -hmm. let's recap quickly. Hadrian had taken the reins of power after Trajan died. Hadrian quickly brought an end to Trajan's wars of expansion, uh, brought the borders back to where they had been previously, and then oversaw two decades of mostly peace. Uh, Hadrian and his wife had not gotten along, and it is likely that Hadrian preferred the comforts of men to women. So he uh, did not have any children, the fourth time in a row that we don't have a biological heir. Hadrian, his health deteriorating in his early 60s, adopted a man named Lucius Sionius Commodus. You remember him? Lots of names. Yeah, mm-hmm. lots of names. Not as many as many have. Right. Uh, there was a long history of cooperation between these two, which is why Hadrian likely chose this longtime partner. Uh, it also helped that Lucius already had sons, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, notably a very young one, also named Lucius Sionius Commodus. Now, everyone in this entire thing has so many names. Uh, And they change a lot. So we're just going to call people by the name that they're most commonly referred to as right off the bat. So we're going to call this Lucius, Lucius Ferris. This is the little boy. Okay, the young one. All right. The six-year-old. Hadrian hoped for a continuation of the smooth transition of power seen for the past few emperors. Uh, But then Lucius the Elder died before Hadrian did. (laughs) Uh, That's right. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Suddenly started bleeding a lot. Uh, This despite Hadrian being very unwell and actively seeking to end his own Mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. So Hadrian settled on Antoninus Pius, a 51-year-old senator who was admired by his peers. And of course, the Senate loved this idea. They figured this could be a much better Nerva, a senator who becomes emperor and uh, will treat the Senate very well. Right. However, Antoninus also had no living sons. So what to do? Uh, there were two conditions on Antoninus' adoption. Antoninus must adopt the young Marcus Aurelius mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and Lucius Verus, the son of the man who died. Yep. Verus was around seven, six or seven at this time, while Marcus was around 16. Verus was likely included due to Hadrian's closeness with his father, and he was in need of a dad. So mm-hmm. why not just get him adopted Marcus, however, was chosen because Hadrian had seen great potential in the young man, even when he was very young. Little boy level, he was seeing to his education. But we'll cover that more later. Uh, It would seem the plan was for the elderly Antoninus to rule for a few years to maybe a decade, with Marcus under his wing. Uh, And then this would allow the lad to grow up and hopefully avoid another Nero situation. Right. Nobody likes that. Very young, spoiled, all-powerful 
teen. Yep. Not good. Hey, would you like to have all the power in the world yeah, right. while you're also incapable of controlling your emotions whatsoever? Sounds good. Yeah. Varys may or may not have been included in Hadrian's plan or vision for imperial lineage. It may have been a case of just adopt him so he has a father mm -hmm. and is looked after by the imperial family. And so it was. Antoninus was adopted by Hadrian and simultaneously adopted the two boys. Uh, some might consider this the beginning of Antoninus' reign, as Hadrian was very unwell and was seen less and less in public. So Antoninus took up many of the imperial duties and was known to have been very close with his dying counterpart. Uh, some sources claim that Antoninus uh, <laughs> prevented Hadrian from committing suicides personally. <laughs> um, like, just his, let me, just let me do it. <laughs> just let this misery end now, Hadrian. Sick for so many years. <laughs> We've talked about this. Uh, the Historia Augusta also says this about Hadrian's final months. Quote, Antoninus preserved those whom Hadrian, during his ill health, had ordered be killed. Mm -hmm. So he was uh, potentially going a little bit uh, murder crazy in his final months. But uh, Antoninus was like, ah, that's just, he'll be fine. He'll be fine. Just let him go. Or just, oh, yeah, he's dead. He's dead. For sure. Don't get yeah. out of bed, though. He's like, if I can't kill myself, I can kill these guys. Right. <laughs> Antoninus was also known to physically help Hadrian into and out of the Senate Hall. So this was a very close relationship as, as the slightly older man was dying. And it didn't take long for Hadrian to finally die. A few months after his appointment as heir, Antoninus became emperor. To highlight the craziness of imperial names at this point, I wanted to give you uh, his full name. Imperator Caesar Titus Alias Hadrianus Antoninus Augustus Pontifus Maximus. Why? They're all just titles. So many. Yep, so many. Uh, today, we know him as Antoninus Pius, and not pious as in religious, but uh, this is pious as in dutiful. Mm. Uh, the name he... This is actually a name that he had in life, mm -hmm. not something that we gave him later. And he earned it pretty quickly, right off the bat, uh, as he became emperor. There's a few theories as to why the Senate gave him this title, um, but it was likely stopping Hadrian and then being dutiful and taking up the reins. As I mentioned... Hadrian was not in the good graces of the Senate. No. Nope. He wasn't loathed like Domitian or anything like that, but he was almost always out of Rome and known to flaunt his wealth and prestige a bit. Uh, he had also killed some senators, as we remember. After his death, the Senate was strongly in favor of not deifying him. Not okay. Flat out refused. Yeah, that's not cool, though. It would have been a really bad look, mm -hmm. especially for, for Antoninus. Uh, he went before the Senate and basically said... Uh, you don't think Hadrian did a good job? You don't like his decisions? Well, then you must think that his choice of me as heir oh, was also go. terrible. There you go. Perhaps I should just step down. Oh. If you hate my father so much. Got him. That's right. Adopted. Yep. That's true. Exactly. <laughs> uh, this shut the Senate up right away. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this sounds really good on Antoninus's part, and it is, but it is also you know personal. The mm -hmm. imperial cult is very important. Right. And if Antoninus's father, adoptive father, uh, wasn't deified it would look really bad especially since he laid out like the next two emperors. yeah for sure so hadrian was deified and antoninus set about ruling uh so choosing the 51 year old makes a good deal of sense uh the question is why did hadrian insist on marcus being adopted as well so let's take a look at this remarkable 16 year old who would become an emperor Marcus was born April 26th, 121 CE. This would have been the very early years of Hadrian's reign because he came into power in 117. Mm -hmm. His name, like many of the time, was not Marcus uh, Aurelius at birth. That changed later. Um, but we're not sure what his name actually was okay. at specific times for certain things. So uh, he'll just be Marcus. Marcus yeah, Aurelius. Yeah, I suppose for it us. makes sense until he's known. Doesn't right. Really. And, an, and then yeah. some of the things, like, he may have taken the title at this time, mm -hmm. or maybe this time. Kind of whatever. It doesn't right. really matter. He's Marcus Aurelius to us. He came from an old and prestigious family. His forefathers held important roles going back several generations. The family also claimed lineage to the probably mythical second king of Rome, Numa. Mm. He was kind of the good lawgiver, so everyone wanted to be related to Numa. Mm -hmm. uh, at three years old, Marcus's father died suddenly. Uh, it is unlikely Marcus uh, had actual memories of his father, but in his private writings, he talks about how he learned, quote, modesty and manliness from his father's memory. Hmm. Regardless, Marcus and his mother then fell under the care of his paternal grandfather. This was, of course, another Marcus who was an influential man. Everyone's named the same thing. That's right. 
<laughs> Marcus learned a lot from both of his grandfathers as they raised him. He spent much of his time in either of their palaces or various villas. So they're a very well, high up and nice. hoity-toity yeah. family. That's right. Well, where are you staying tonight? I don't know. I haven't decided which villa which I want to Which palace? I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, it is around this time that Marcus claims he learned, quote, good character and avoidance of bad temper. From his grandfathers, which is a good thing. Interesting. Yes. Though he greatly enjoyed being with these men, he found one of his grandfather's mistresses unbearable. Uh, he is noted for having been grateful to be free of her later on. Oh. <laughs> that, that doesn't go anywhere. I just wanted to share that even even emperors didn't like their stepmoms. It's like, yeah, this lady is just so annoying. <laughs> just get her out of here. Uh, he was an athletic youth, noted for enjoying boxing and wrestling. A man nice. after my own heart. He also trained with weaponry and joined an order of priests dedicated to Mars. Uh, this order was responsible for sacred shields, which certainly looks nice on a resume. Mm-hmm. And I had to stop myself from looking into the <laughs> sacred shields. Yeah, don't go so deep. As, as was common for wealthy boys of the age, Marcus was schooled at home by personal tutors. Mm-hmm. He had mm-hmm. quite a few of these through his childhood and even into his adult life. One key man was Diognetus. That's not how you say that name. Well, didn't uh, think so. <laughs> it was this man who may have first introduced the young Marcus to the world of philosophy. Oh, boy. We will discuss Deep his thought. philosophical beliefs later, because they do become quite important. But Marcus seems to have fallen madly in love with being a student of philosophy. Despite his wealthy environment, he began wearing cheap, rough Greek robes and oh. sleeping on the floor. Okay. Until well, his mom told him to knock it off. Yeah, like, hey, man, listen. Like, you got to sleep, in, the sleep bed. in a bed. All right. You're being weird. <laughs> I get it. You can read your books, but do it in your bed. That's right. He had uh, many more important tutors in his life, and as he grew into his teen years, he was surrounded by some of the best minds of the empire. Near the end of 136 CE, Hadrian nearly died, <gasps> as we discussed. This is what uh, spooked him initially, and uh, he decided he needed that heir that mm-hmm. we discussed earlier. He then chose Commodus, uh, well, Lucius Commodus, as right. his heir. Uh, it's a bit confused if Lucius was to adopt Marcus, if that was the plan initially. Probably not, since he had a six-year-old right, son Right, he already had own. a son, yeah. Um, either way, Lucius died less than two years later, and it was then Antoninus Pius was chosen, on condition that he adopt Marcus. Mm-hmm. It was also during this adoption ceremony that Hadrian declared the son of Lucius Commodus, who we've decided is Lucius Verus, would be betrothed to Antoninus's daughter, Faustina. Faustina would have been around 15 and Varus around 6 or 7, so they wow. had some waiting to do. Yeah. But uh, he was hoping to uh, get those imperial ties set. That's a real uh, Anakin Skywalker and Padme situation right there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's one thing they just kind of gloss are like, she met him as a little boy. <laughs> yeah. No, he was like he was like 10. She yeah. was like 15. It's fine. Was it only that? Big a gap. I Something thought she like was. That. I thought she was like in her twenties in the first movie. No, oh, okay. no, she's well, a that's very, less, very young queen. Well, five years isn't that bad. Yeah, but they Once met they're when they were both children. Yeah, they, start, yeah. they started the vibes early, and you're like, hey, now, yeah. come on, <laughs> what are you doing? So, how do you think Marcus took uh, this news of his adoption and becoming the heir to the empire? Hmm. Since he was deep in that philosophy, may- maybe he didn't like it at first. Quite right. Yeah, uh, he was quite upset by the news. Uh, he was really into his studies and mm-hmm. really into philosophy, as only teenagers can be. Right. Really into it. <laughs> uh, imperial power also did not mesh well with this worldview. Um, plus, Hadrian was old, disabled, and grumpy. Uh, this adoption meant he would have to go live with him. Ah. Oh. Yeah. Still, he was eventually convinced and probably told, like, you don't have a choice. Yeah, like, it's too bad, man. It's been <laughs> and, decided. And moved in with his new adoptive father, grandfather, and brother. Because everyone all moved into the Imperial yeah. Palace together. Uh, in short time, Hadrian convinced the Senate to allow Marcus to serve as quaestor before the legal age of 24. He would have been around 17. Which is, again, high praise from, yeah. from Hadrian. Marcus did not need to deal with the emperor for long. Which was right. fortunate for him. It's sad too because Hadrian sees such great things in Marcus, yeah, he's and like, Marcus is like, oh, I hate this, this guy. fucking grumpy old yeah. dude. Like, come on, man. <laughs> but he only Hadrian only lasted a few months, and then he left Antoninus in charge. Yeah, uh, holding the reins for Marcus until he was old enough to carry them himself. Probably just a few years at most. As we discuss, Antoninus slipped right into the purple without much issue. Mm-hmm. Hadrian was deified, and Antoninus picked up right where he had left off. Antoninus saw wisdom in Hadrian's policy of defense rather than offense. He continued in this vein throughout his term as emperor. 
Very, very smart. Yes. The major difference between the two men was that Antoninus never left Italy while he was oh. in charge. Yeah, so he was not, uh, didn't like to go check out his empire. Yes, he exactly. It's fine. I know it's there. A quote from the Historia Augusta. He did not engage in any expeditions, saying that the retinue of a princeps, even a very economical one, was burdensome to the provincials. Basically, if, if the emperor rolls through your town, it's probably going to cost your town a fortune and ah. be a big burden on it, which is a good excuse to not go travel around. I suppose, yeah, if you're expecting home. them to, like, I don't know, like throw a parade or something. Exactly. Yeah. So while Hadrian had spent most of his time traveling, Antoninus ruled from home, something the certain uh, Senate certainly loved. Right. And shortly after becoming emperor, Antoninus approached Marcus. Mm -hmm. He said, hey, what do you think about marrying my daughter, Faustina? <laughs> He's probably like, eh, eh, I don't think so. Well, well what he said was, um, isn't she uh, betrothed oh, to your right. other adoptive son, right. Varys? My adopted brother? <laughs> yeah. And Antoninus said, well, yes. <laughs> but come on. He's just a little boy. And between you and me, I'd much rather you become emperor after me. This will help solidify things even further. It would, yeah. Yeah. So, having little choice, once again, yeah. Marcus broke off his betrothal that he had with some oh, other woman. Yeah. And Varys was given no choice on his. That's, Soon, Marcus and that. Faustina were married. Good times. Yeah, for real. Over the following years, Marcus was Antoninus' shadow. The two were rarely apart. Uh, Antoninus included his Caesar, heir, mm -hmm. in almost everything he did. Early on, he cautioned the young man, quote, See that you do not turn into a Caesar. Do not be dipped into the purple dye, for that can happen. So don't get lost in being right. the heir or being royalty, which is... Uh, Pretty easy for a young philosopher. Yeah, don't get a big head. Mm -hmm. Marcus was granted many titles and responsibilities throughout this time. By all accounts, he did very well in everything that was given to him. Marcus was consul with his adoptive father in 140 CE. Uh, he was in an order of knights around this time as well. Hmm. And Antoninus forced him to live in the palace despite his objections. <laughs> I just want to sleep outside. Let me sleep on the floor <laughs> beneath the sky. That's all I want. Writings from Marcus indicate a constant inner struggle with his stoic beliefs, which mm -hmm, we will discuss mm -hmm. later, and the imperial lifestyle. Marcus continued his education while awaiting his turn as emperor. A man called Fronto became a close friend and confidant. Uh, it helped that he was one of the best Latin writers and speakers ever. Oh. Full stop. Considered up there with the likes of Cicero, Impressive. who by this point is a legend. We know a fair bit about Fronto and Marcus, thanks to some very well-preserved letters between the two. The correspondence is um, very intimate. <laughs> a quote from one of the letters. This is Marcus to Fronto. Farewell, my Fronto, wherever you are. My most sweet love and delight. Oh, my. How is it between you and me? I love you, and you oh. are not here. Oh, wow. Uh, this is something I did not know about Aurelius before starting my research. Mm. Um, and these letters may be the oldest examples of love letters, straight or gay, that we have. Yeah, to yeah there's day. not much left to the imagination there. No. Not with nope. that one. It's pretty straightforward. Because I, I had heard of Fronto and Marcus, like, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, he's a great writer and stuff. And I was like, oh, well, all right then. Yeah, they had a thing. Okay, so regardless of Marcus's feelings for Fronto, uh, he also had feelings for his wife, Faustina. Oh, that's good. These feelings would result in something most emperors had been lacking for several generations. Biological heir. Children! Let's Woo! go! The first came in 140 CE. A girl named Domitia. Oh. And uh, just for fun, I'm just going to get you a piece of paper here. I, I meant to grab yeah, you a notebook. We, uh, who needs a notebook? But I didn't do it, so here you go. Oh, oh! I'm gonna write. I was like, these are these are lyrics to a song that we. Yeah, well, I, I'm using our music I, stand. What? Uh, you can go ahead and just uh, we're gonna we're gonna keep track of the children. Oh God! You today. think I can spell anything? Domitia. It's I'm stop. curious. I'm I'm curious how you're gonna spell it. I don't even know yet. Is that a work? Yeah, that's how you spell it. Is there a T or an S that you put between the eyes? An S. Okay, it's a T. Well, there you go. You're that. Hey, that's no, pretty close, I'm not though. changing it. That's fine. So that's Domitia. <laughs> She was born in uh, 147. This is great. And then... This is great. Another... Did you say 147? Yeah. In 149. In oh. fact, it was twins. Oh, wait. Oh, twins are born in yes. 149. All right. Titus and Tiberius. I don't remember how to spell these things. It's actually pretty neat. We have coins uh, of this time depicting the boys with an inscription, quote, the happiness of the times. Later hmm. that same year, we have coins depicting Domitia and just one boy. Oh. 
And then later that same year, we have um, a further coin with just the girl. So you can cross out both those boys. Oh, they died. That's yep. unfortunate. You should have told me not to try to spell their names. No, it's fine. We need to keep we need to keep track. Okay. All right. The happiness of the times did not last long. These boys were buried in the mausoleum of Hadrian. Uh, this was completed in 139 CE and currently housed Hadrian and several others. It still stands today, actually. This is the Castel St. Angelo. Cool. Yeah. Marcus and his wife were obviously devastated. Right, uh, as you are. But they still had their little girl. Letters between Fronto and Marcus show that Domitia was also unwell at this oh, time. Quote, what? if the gods are willing, we seem to have a hope of recovery. The diarrhea has stopped. The little attacks of fever have been driven away. But the emaciation is still extreme, and there is still quite a bit of coughing. What have they been doing to their kids? Right. In 151, less than two years after the twins, Domitia died as well. No! Marcus's writings show us that he struggled deeply with how to feel about and handle the deaths of his children. A quote from him, One man prays, How may I not lose my little children? But you must pray, How may I not be afraid to lose them? Oh. Ooh, yeah. A Let man who's already lost three children tethers. very quickly, uh, and you can feel it. Like, yeah. Ooh, that hurts. Yeah. That hurts. And this will tie directly into his stoic beliefs, which I think now is a good time to cover, because they will play an important role throughout the rest of his life. This I'm taking primarily from the author Gregory Hayes, who did a translation of Marcus's writings, and this is part of the intro where he explains what Stoicism is. Massive overview. Uh, quote from this book, Of the doctrine central to the Stoic worldview, perhaps the most important is the unwavering conviction that the world is organized in a rational and coherent way. Oh. This organization is directed by a thing called logos. This is where the root for uh, the word logic comes from. Logos was uh, not an abstract concept. It was an all-pervading force okay. that affected the world. Wonderful. In people, logos took the form of reason, okay. what we would consider logic. Yeah. In the universe, it was nature, okay. life, everything. Because logos controlled everything, Stoics found themselves backed into a corner of a deterministic system. Human free will is negligible if everything that is going to happen will happen regardless of what we do. Mm -hmm. But the Stoics were philosophers <laughs> and found a way around this mindset. Not good. Instead of saying, quote, nothing can change, so why bother? Stoics said, quote, yes, this is going to happen, but you might as well make the best of it. Okay. <laughs> An example provided by Mays is, quote, a man is like a dog tied to a moving wagon. If the dog refuses to run along with the wagon, he will be dragged by it. Yet the choice remains his, to run or be dragged. I guess. Which is a still kind a, of a dark view. Yeah. But a little better than nothing matters and free will is yeah, nothing. An interesting take on free will. Yes. Yeah. So obviously, surface level, look at stoicism. Because mm -hmm. I'm not going to try and learn all their beliefs. No. Uh, but it helps to put into perspective the man about which we are learning. Uh, and his stoic beliefs would come in very handy as the years went by. Shortly before the death of Domitia, they had another girl in 150 CE. Oh. Lucilla. Luce, Lucilla. And then another you one. You said 150? Sure did. I, uh, he broke his lead. I don't use mechanical pencils. Uh, and then oh, in 151, they had Faustina. That's a lot. The younger, younger, as I wrote in my notes, because she is <laughs> the daughter of Faustina the younger. Faustina. You said one year later? Yep, so 151. That's and then math. a boy oh, in 152. Finally. Antoninus was his name. Again, we have wonderful coins depicting the two girls and an die. infant. <laughs> 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 These coins also state, quote, to Augusta's fertility. Obviously, Faustina was well regarded. Yeah. Uh, a few women bore this many children. And cranking them out. And so quickly. Same woman, huh? Yes, yes. Good for her. Yes, however... Antoninus did not last long. Dang. He likely died in 152 or 153, ah. around the same time as Marcus's sister. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. It's really bad. Unfortunately, uh, around 155, Marcus's mother also died. Dang. This man is surrounded by death. Just wait. Yeah. <laughs> then, around 158, we have evidence that another boy uh, died, though we don't know his name. Dang. Yep. Unknown. Yep. That is what I had in my notes, too. 158. Dead. 
Now, in an incredibly <laughs> short time. When, when was the first one born? 147. Yeah. He has lost so a many lot. children. A lot of children and family members. Yes. Um, but in 159 and 160, two more girls came along, and they didn't die right oh away. Oh, my God. It Wait, was, are these other two still alive? If I haven't told you they're dead, yeah, then they're still alive. Okay, well. So it's Fadilla. <laughs> Fadilla. <laughs> Quasadilla. Yeah, that's exactly where my brain went. 159. 159. And then Conificia. All right, come on now. <laughs> <laughs> In 160. Uh, con- what? Conificia. Conificia. Just an I after every letter. That's pretty much Sia. how it goes. <laughs> Conificia. And, and where's the 160? Yep. And then these two were named for Marcus's and Faustina's late sisters. All right. By this point, Antoninus had been in charge for a while. Yeah. Varus had grown up quite a bit from the little boy mm-hmm. he had been to a young man looking for his role in right. all this. While Marcus was granted consulships and titles and a seat at the emperor's right hand, mm-hmm. Varus got nothing. But the oh. title of Son of Augustus. Oh, not again. We're going to have another one of another eager heirs like, hey, let me learn something. Let me do something. Ah, sometime, eventually. The problem was, Varus was so different from Marcus. Uh, where Marcus was calm, quiet, focused, Varus was brash, fun-loving, and a bit wild. Mm-hmm. He loved hunting and sporting events, as well as gladiatorial fights and chariot races. Let's go. Uh, Marcus is noted for having a distaste for gladiatorial combats. Oh, Combat. I'm so glad they got it right in Gladiator. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. Antoninus was getting old. Mm-hmm. He was around 70 and could not stand up straight without strapping wood to his torso for support. God. Yeah, he had a very bad back problem. <laughs> old school scoliosis <laughs> brace. Here you go. Just just get me a plank. Just straps a plank away. I imagine. <laughs> what if it's just a, a, one of those uh, curved rectangular swords that the Romans used to yeah. scoot him just like <laughs> on his go. chest? There you go. Uh, his diet had diminished to mostly bread and water. Dang. Obviously, Marcus was taking on more and more of the administrative mm-hmm. duties by this stage. Varus was not. Then, Marcus was made Praetorian Prefect and shared another consulship. Oh. This time with Varus. Okay, well, it's kind hey, of something. Good job, Varus. Was it a title a or did he get to do something? Well, consul doesn't do anything. It's just uh, you need okay. to be consul to be important. I but guess. They don't <laughs> do much. Uh, you will likely have noticed that we haven't talked about Antoninus' reign much. Right. I've just been kind of telling you a little bit about Marcus over these last yeah, I'm assuming it's, it's just going smoothly. Yeah. Marcus uh, Antoninus Pius oversaw the most peaceful reign in all of Western Roman history. Good for him. There were a few minor revolts. There always are. Right. Um, but they were quickly put down. The only major offensive uh, of this entire period was a northern push past Hadrian's Wall in Britain. Oh, dang. To the thing where he said, we should stop here. Yeah. They're like, what if we, what if we go 40 oh, miles they tried north? they to push out. Oh, oh yeah. okay. I, it didn't work, did it? Well, they went up 40 miles further north uh-huh. and then put the Antonine Wall up. <laughs> but it was made of dirt, mainly. God. And uh, Here's a berm. Put a, put so a berm up. <laughs> it didn't last long. Yeah. It was in service a very short time. And then they fell back to the, the yeah. Hadrian Wall. The real wall. Yep. They're like, yeah, that makes more sense. This was probably just to give Antoninus some military prestige. Um, he had no military experience, and following Trajan and Hadrian, he kind of needed to look like he knew how to control the military. Right. Trajan was a great conqueror. Hadrian clearly knew what he was doing mm-hmm. on the battlefield. Mm-hmm. So this was probably just an attempt to get some prestige. It, it didn't work great. They're probably like, no. oh, look, you, you kind of did a thing. Right. <laughs> he also didn't personally fight or anything. He didn't yeah. go there. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, at one point, it looked like the Parthians were about to invade the East once again. <sighs> According to the Historia Augusta, quote, merely by a letter, he caused the king of the Parthians to, des- to desist from assaulting the Armenians. The empire was strong enough that a threat from the emperor could stop a war. Yeah. is essentially similar to how Hadrian had personally met with a Parthian mm-hmm, king mm-hmm. to avoid war right. decades earlier. Would you like to guess how long uh, Antoninus' reign was? And I'll, I'll give you a quick reminder. So Augustus is around 40 years, Tiberius 23, Hadrian 21, and Trajan 19. And he was supposed to be there for just a little bit until Marcus took over. I'm looking, I'm looking at the kids' ages here. Oh, yeah. To, trying to source something out. Yep. Uh, 22 years. 22.5 years. Nailed it. <laughs> Let's Look go. At that. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> so much for a few years for Marcus to mature. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was a, he was middle-aged. Yeah, he was like, I'm ready. I've been an adult for a while. Yep. Uh. So Antoninus uh, 
had overseen an extended era of peace and prosperity. Mm -hmm. Trajan's wars and Hadrian's travels had left the empire the strongest it had ever been. Yeah. And Antoninus maintained this momentum and just kind of sat back. Well, yeah, once you reach stability and you can just continue getting prosperous, well, yeah, let's not ruin that. One other thing that I keep, I kept telling myself when I was like out walking and thinking about this script was add in this one little factoid and then I just didn't. So I'm just going to say it now. Here we go. Uh, Antoninus also uh, oversaw the 900th anniversary of Rome and had massive celebrations during his reign. Oh, yeah. So great time. Good for him. Absolutely. Uh, But then he died. He took a fever and the next day he formally handed power to Marcus Aurelius and then died in his bed. Dang. So he knew. he's like, oh, I'm sick. <laughs> yeah, I I decided to skip him. I feel like if if you gave Hadrian the Great and then didn't give it to Antoninus Pius, it would be unfair because you know he ruled longer and it was more peaceful and better. Um, but he was kind of boring, so we didn't cover. Yeah, him. you could argue that he just it was so good for him because it had been established for him already. Right. There wasn't much he really had to do other than maintain. Exactly. He could have messed it up. He could have messed it up. That's for sure. But he, he kept it rolling. Yeah. So we skipped over him. But now you see why. It mm-hmm. was a good reign, but a boring one. Now, tradition held that uh, Romans always acted like they did not want imperial power. Ugh, right. I, I, yeah, yeah, I yeah. couldn't. I couldn't. Okay, fine. If you insist for the state, That's right. I will do it. I'll do it. It lines up with the historical role of dictator, which mm. we've discussed, a short-term kingship, essentially, mm-hmm. which was always, almost always, handed back peacefully. Right. Uh, Marcus might have been one of the few emperors to truly mean, yeah, I don't want to like, no. do this. <laughs> Ever since I was a child, I was just like, please, I just can I just read my books and chill? Can we just <laughs> not, please? Uh, he was highly educated and philosophical. Mm-hmm. He was a Stoic, so the universe had led him to this position, which right. meant he could not turn away from his obligation, right. and he was meant to be emperor. Yeah, walk with gonna, it or let it drag you. Exactly. He's going to put his all into it, just just like the dog. Mm-hmm. Uh, what would follow Antoninus's death would be the usual formalities of transferring imperial power from Antoninus to Marcus. Mm-hmm. The Senate would approve of the measure and grant Marcus all the titles he was due as emperor. All was going according to Antoninus's plan. Except... But who else might have a position, be in a position to claim the throne? Well, I guess the child. That's not a child anymore because it took so long. That's right. Antoninus <laughs> had, had adopted two boys. That's right. At Hadrian's command. Yeah. Uh, one was the son of the man Hadrian had originally chosen as his heir. Mm-hmm. Lucius Verus uh, clearly had a strong claim, if not stronger than Marcus Aurelius. I don't know. It's a lot of it's a lot of backtracking here. Be like, I'm the oldest of the <laughs> emperor. Okay. Right. Too bad. So sad. Right. Your heir. What do you think happened? Uh, nah. Uh, dang. I don't think Marcus would have had him killed. He doesn't seem like that kind of guy. Okay. I don't know. Maybe made a fuss, but then the Senate was like, nah. To everyone's surprise, Marcus declared that he would only serve so long as his brother served as his co-emperor. Oh. The Senate was shocked. That always goes well. Why would such a learned wise man try to hand away half his power let alone to someone as unremarkable as Varus. that's right marcus claimed this was because he wished to follow hadrian's wishes mm. uh, but we'll remember that marcus didn't know hadrian for long and he did not really like him that well yeah other reasons could be that he simply felt it was Varus's right or maybe he knew how big the job was and wanted someone to assist him or maybe he saw an out to be like, oh, I have to do with less of the bull crap? Yes. Yeah. 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 You, yeah. You can come with me. That might not be true because we'll <laughs> see that Varys isn't quite the guy you want to handle the bull crap. Well, but, maybe he learned that very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but Marcus had been assisting Antoninus for tw- over yeah. 20 years. Yeah. Uh, and as one might expect, Varys was definitely going to be the junior mm-hmm. of the two emperors. With little choice but to accept, the Senate gave imperial authority to both men. For the first time ever, we have two emperors of Rome who are not trying to kill each other. And those two emperors had to go on a walk to talk with the Praetorian Guard. Nice. Uh, the two entered the Praetorian camp and Varus informed the assembled men of this new arrangement. <laughs> Listen, we're both in charge, okay? Yeah. And they seemed to take the news well, especially when Varus mentioned their donative. Yeah, I was going to be like, hey, as long as you pay us, I don't really care who's in charge. <laughs> well, logic would stand. There's two new emperors. Oh, uh, yeah. Dang, I was just thinking that. There's two of you, therefore we should get twice the money. Maybe we should know? get two. So 20,000 oh, sesterces per man <laughs> with more for the officers. Oh, God. That's so much. They accepted. 
I I imagine. Yeah. Open arms, open wallets. <laughs> I bet. Let's go. So Antoninus's funeral was a big ordeal. Uh, there was likely a lot of partying and games mm-hmm. held. Then Antoninus's ashes were placed in Hadrian's mausoleum next to Hadrian and several of Marcus and Faustina's children. Right, except for the four women that are still alive, apparently. Speaking of their children, yeah. remember Lucilla? <laughs> yeah, right so, there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the oldest alive still. Yes. Don't worry, she didn't die. Oh. Instead, the Dude. 11-year-old was to be betrothed to her oh, adoptive God. uncle, oh, Lucius God. Verus. Ah. <laughs> yes. How, who would have been in his early 30s. Yeah, I was like, come on. <laughs> they didn't get married for a little bit. Good, but a little bit was probably somewhere when she was like fourteen or fifteen. Probably, yeah, I didn't probably. I didn't think to look or put it in here, but yeah, this is when they were betrothed and they did get married eventually. Uh, it was also in this first year that Marcus and Faustina had a couple more kids. Dang, she's still pumping them out. Twin boys, Titus oh! and Commodus. Wait, Titus, take two. Yeah, some of them I couldn't like. They all usually have three names, right? Yeah. And in the list that I saw. I couldn't tell sometimes which one would have been the name you would call them because oh, they would right. like switch. Like some mm-hmm. would be like the first name clearly was the one you'd call, and then mm-hmm. others it was the third, and some of the girls it was the middle, and I was like, <laughs> I'm just gonna call know, them man. something. It doesn't really matter. What was the second one? It was Titus and Commodus. Com- Commodus. 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 Why are they all like that? Commodus. I don't even care. What, what year is this now? Uh, the 161. <laughs> when oh, they when oh, they okay. first came to the throne. Okay, okay. So they were they were greeted with twin boys. Well, wait, wait, wait. Do you, do you hear that? Didn't wait, turn out well. The sound of is that hooves <laughs> coming from the east? Are you kidding me? Yes. Why? Or no? I suppose someone write another letter. Yeah. <laughs> write another write well, letter. Get appar- it out there. <laughs> apparently, Antoninus Pius went to his grave complaining about the headache caused by Volagasis the Fourth, <sighs> the king of Parthia. The king, yeah. It's- as we mentioned, it is possible Antoninus avoided a war with a stern letter. Mm-hmm. Since Trajan had whooped up on them two generations ago, the Parthians have posed little to no threat to Rome. Until now. Oh my god. Very early into the joint reigns of Marcus and Varus, the Volagasis marched his armies into Armenia. Armenia at this time was still a client state after Trajan's conquests, mm. mm-hmm. but I, it was kind of confusing because Hadrian like made them not a client state again, but then they're, they're like a client king. I don't know. It was weird. Their status as province was reduced back to client kingdom ruled by us, I think. Uh, anyway, oh, the Romans brought, are in yeah. charge of Armenia. Mm-hmm. And the uh, Volagasis just marched the Parthian army into Armenia to take it back. That is a pretty strong declaration of war. Yep. They quickly overpowered the kingdom and placed their own man on the throne. Uh, a man named Servianus was the gover- governor of Cappadocia, therefore in the best location to respond. Mm-hmm. This is where the legions are always sitting waiting to respond right. to the Parthians. Uh, he was an experienced military man from Gaul. However, oh. he was charmed by a man with a snake. <gasps> this prophet was called Alexander of Abonutichus. That's it. And his <laughs> snake was called Glycon. <laughs> All right. Severianus was captivated by Alexander and his predictions. The prediction he liked the best was the one where Alexander said, Yo, if you go all out and attack the Parthians right now, this very instant, you will win great victory and glory, but you got to go right now. Go. Was it a trap? Nope. Oh. Just, just a crazy man with oh, a snake. Oh, just a man was like, I saw it. But the snake told me. Severianus did just that. Ugh. He crossed the border into Armenia at full haste and quickly found himself trapped. Oh, my God. A Parthian general had him cornered with no chance of escape. And within three days of setting out on the campaign, Severianus had committed suicide and his entire legion was massacred. Oh, what Not an a idiot. great start to a war. No. Let alone to the start of the emperorships of Marcus and Varus. Was it just a legion, did you say? That legion, yeah. He just, had he a just legion. had one legion? Okay. Yep. Before we continue, it is important to remember something about Marcus and Varus. Neither of them had an ounce of military experience. No. Yeah, except for Marcus's little fun just like weapon practice. Weapon practice, but, but that not, is not military yeah. experience. <laughs> Antoninus had also been very green mm-hmm. in military affairs. Mm-hmm. But Marcus hadn't even served the usual stint as military tribune. Right. He had been catapulted ahead on the Cursus Honorum and then filled a bunch of ceremonial mm-hmm. positions from there. Hadrian had seen his potential from a very young age and saw to his education and upbringing. And it was fitting that the peace-loving Hadrian didn't impose military training yeah. on the quiet, philosophical young boy. 
Pius had followed the same mindset. He rarely left the capital, and Marcus was with him the whole time. And now, after nearly 40 years of peace, and with two emperors lacking the skill set to handle this, the one major external threat to the empire has come crashing in and slaughtered a legion, all in the first few months of Marcus and Varus' reign. Uh-oh. Then news arrived that another Roman general had been defeated and forced to retreat. Oh, come oh, on. And barbarians in Britain and Germania are kicking up a bit of a fuss. Ah. After two decades of relative peace under Antoninus, the floodgates of war were mm-hmm. now breaking at an expedited rate. Well, you got to think. Do you, do you th- were the army were the armies training in between this time? Precisely. You know, I know Hadrian was like, "Hey, you got to be ready, all right." I know we're ready. not currently at war. We got to be ready. I don't think Antoninus probably kept that up too well. Right. Four years of of no actual significant mm-hmm. conflict and no emperor going around making sure everyone's doing what they're supposed to yeah. do. So yeah, you can imagine the troops aren't the best. The generals are inexperienced, and now the Parthians are being real aggressive. Yeah. So after the annihilation of one legion and the forced retreat of another, mass reinforcements were sent to the Eastern Front. Legions and vexillations were sent from Africa, Italy, and Greece. And I learned that vexillations are smaller task force and detachments. Oh, okay. Yeah, just a fun thing I learned. Importantly, troops were also pulled from the Rhine and Danube regions. The governors there were given strict instructions. Don't piss anyone off. (laughs) Just Just don't fight. Be nice, all right? Avoid conflict. Yeah. Letters between Marcus and Fronto from these early days show a great deal of apprehension from Marcus. Mm -hmm. The 40-year-old emperor could not even relax during a wonderful public holiday. Quote, I have duties hanging over me that can hardly be begged off. This is what he told Fronto when Fronto suggested he chill. Ah. Fronto replied by sending Cicero's account of Pompey taking command of the Mithridatic War. Mithridatic. Quote, you will find in it many chapters aptly suited to your present councils concerning the choice of army commanders, the interests of allies, the protection of provinces, the discipline of the soldiers, and the qualifications required for commanders in the field and elsewhere. He closed out the correspondence by reminding Marcus, quote, always and everywhere, Mars has changed our troubles into successes and our terrors into triumphs. This is a reference to the horrible Roman defeats at places like Carhi, Cannae, and others, Mm -hmm. where mass Mm -hmm. loss seemed like the end, but the Romans always came Came out on top. We got to talk about Hannibal someday. Shit's crazy. (laughs) As the months wore on, unrest began to brew in Syria, close to the front with the Parthians. Things seemed to be going downhill, despite Fronto's words of encouragement. Mm -hmm. So a decision was made. An emperor needed to go out and take command of the war effort. This is what Trajan had done, and Hadrian and Caesar. The yeah. emperor chosen to shoulder this burden was, of course, Varus. Yeah, I was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh. He's gonna, see, the, only, the difference is the previous emperors who did this had a little bit of experience before taking charge of a war campaign. <laughs> right. Well, it is a longstanding question of why Varus was given this instruction by Marcus and the Senate. Uh, both were inexperienced. Mm-hmm. Uh, Varus was younger and apparently healthier. Uh, Marcus was wiser. Now, Marcus had his hands full in Rome. The Tiber River had flooded. Oh, man. Very badly flooded. Freaking invasion forces, natural disasters. Yeah. Like, this caused mass property damage, death, and a later famine. Mm. Like, big deal. Marcus and Varus had reportedly both threw themselves into handling this personally Mm -hmm. uh, only months into their reign. And then Marcus also had to oversee the war effort through Varus. So perhaps he felt he should stay in the capital so he could handle everything. Yeah, it's a lot. The most popular account states that Marcus sent Varus off to war with the hopes it would calm the young man down a bit. He was a drinker, a partier, and a bit of a wild Ah, man. Sober him up. Yep. Some say he behaved as Nero had done. Uh, The thought uh, was that sending Varus to war, uh, you know, with a lot of skilled commanders to Mm -hmm. actually do the war, uh, he would be shocked out of his vices, move him out of his routines, and help him grow up a bit. This is just one theory. Uh, As most accounts also state that Varus did a fine job as an administrator who liked to part. Ah, yes. So it's kind of hard to say how bad he actually was. Whatever the case, Varus was soon dispatched to the east to take personal command. Uh, One of the Praetorian prefects was sent with the emperor. His name was Titus Furius Victorinus. Nice. Furious Victorinus. I only included it again because it's such a good name. There's no way you can lose with that. Exactly. Along with him came a small group of senators and a large detachment of Praetorian guards. Mm. So Varus left Rome in the summer of 162. 
he headed for the port city of Brundisium, and Marcus stayed with him uh, for most of the journey south uh, before turning back to return to the capital. Mm -hmm. Then Varys began feasting every night. He would find wealthy locals eagle for imperial gratitude uh, who would host him and his entourage. He also spent some time hunting. Yeah. Not a great look when you're Mm -hmm. supposed to be uh, rushing to the front of a war you're currently losing. Exactly. Uh, It was also around this time that Marcus had another son. <laughs> Let's go. 162. This boy's name was Aeneas. Uh, Aeneas. Yes. Aeneas. That's that's the twelfth child that this woman has pushed out. Yep. What year is this? 162. 162? God dang. As Varus approached Brundisium, he became very ill. Duh. Marcus was informed that his co emperor had taken to bed and would not be able to continue. For some time. Oh, my God. Modern thinking is that Varys suffered a minor stroke. Oh, jeez. Yeah, it would have been 31 or 32. That's, yeah, that's mm-hmm. really early. The Empire prayed for their leader to recover. Mm-hmm. Uh, none more so than Marcus, who rushed back to yeah. the other side. Fortunately, within a couple of weeks, Varys was recovering. Oh, okay, good. Um, good, good. And uh, after further rest, Marcus returned to Rome, and Varys set out once again for the east. <laughs> some have described Varys's entourage as a royal progress. Uh, musicians and artists flocked mm. around the young emperor as he passed through the ancient cities of Greece. Mm-hmm. Uh, there he partook in the Aleutian Mysteries. Those are the ones that Hadrian undertook that uh, in Athens that he was really happy about. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They soon arrived in Asia Minor, modern Turkey, and set about visiting the most luxurious and pleasure-focused cities along this wealthy, gorgeous stretch of the empire. Rushing to the front. Got to get there. <laughs> It is unclear exactly when Varys finally arrived in Antioch. Oh, my God. Uh, this would be the military capital and HQ for the war. Uh, once there, it seems he settled down with a mistress and took up the <laughs> wonderful habit of gambling all night, hanging out with actors, and generally having a good time. I'm so glad he got there to help with the war. It's very imperative <laughs> that he's here. I'm so glad. Fronto, who was also Varys's tutor and a good friend, mm-hmm. defended the emperor, saying, quote, the Roman people needed Lucius's bread and circuses to keep them in check. Oh, okay. So everyone's miserable. Right. Partying is good for everyone. He was there to raise morale. Which is a longstanding belief. You know, bread and games was the way the politicians controlled the masses, mm-hmm. keep them happy and fed. Easy enough. Still, it looked like the plan to get Varus in the war to straighten him up uh, had failed. Another quote, Varys lived in luxury at Antioch, while Marcus was at all hours watching over the business of the Republic and patiently putting up with his brother's luxurious living. Mm -hmm. In short, Marcus, based at Rome, both disposed and ordained everything which was necessary for the war. So, Varys is out there leading. Right. Marcus is actually leading, (laughs) just from further away. In 163 CE, the tables turned in favor of the Romans. Under a man named Priscus, the Roman army retook the capital of Armenia. There you go. Hell yeah. In 164, the capital was ripped apart and rebuilt 30 miles closer to the (laughs) Roman border. (laughs) We're just going to move the city. We're going to move it closer. It's real annoying, like, walking all the way here every time you guys do this. (laughs) We're going to move that closer to our... They called it New City. (laughs) What? Welcome to New City. Welcome to New City, guys. A little straightforward. Yep. And it was at this time that Varus took the title of Armeniacus. <laughs> All right. Conqueror of Armenia. Yeah, I'm sure. This despite the fact he had not set foot on a battlefield. Mm-hmm. He'd barely left the comforts of Antioch for more than a few days uh, in the time he'd been there. Uh, Marcus waited a year before also taking the title. <laughs> Out of respect. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. A Roman senator was placed on the Armenian throne. Naturally, the new yep, king saluted his emperor during his coronation. Yeah. Uh, it's likely the man wasn't even crowned in Armenia. Rather, he probably went to Antioch. Yeah. So Varys yeah. could confirm him. <laughs> Around this time, the Parthians targeted another Roman client state, Osroin, which is not how you say that. Uh, and that was a small client east of Syria. The Parthians deposed the king and installed their own, uh, but he would only last a couple of years before the Romans took it back. Preparations were made for a massive assault throughout 164. By 165, the Romans were ready to uh, and so pushed into Mesopotamia. Under the command of Avidius Cassius, they soon took Nispis, where the majority of the Parthian army had retreated. Mm. The Parthian general is said to have swum down the river and then hidden in a <laughs> cave to avoid the might of the Roman army. Good for him. Way to escape. You gotta do what you gotta do, man. Soon, the capital city of Tesiphon was once again in the sight of the Romans. 
And uh, as has happened several times before and will happen several times in the future, the Parthian capital was sacked by a Roman army. Their imperial palace was burned to the ground. This wonderful news would have fallen on deaf ears when it reached Marcus. However, in 165 CE, one of the twin boys died. No! Which Titus one? Titus? was around four years old. Ugh. Yeah. Tessaphon laid on one side of the Tigris River. Across the river was Seleucia, the former capital of the Seleuc- Seleucid Empire. This was a successor kingdom of Alexander the Great. So that's out where they are now in the mm-hmm. Far East. Uh, as this city was founded by the Macedonians, it was a largely Greek city, yeah. not Parthian. Yeah. So they decided they would open their doors to the Romans after they finished sack- sacking their neighbor city. Oh, okay. What do you think happened? The Romans took it, too. The Romans sacked the city yeah. despite being let in. <laughs> That's a little mean. Yeah, it didn't look good. For. Especially for Varus, who appeared not to have a solid grasp on his men. Ah, yeah. Not that he was physically there. Right. While the troops were celebrating all the death and destruction mm-hmm. they had caused, a few of them uh, started getting sick. Oh, no. We're coming back to where we started. Fevers became common. Dang, along with plague is coming through. <laughs> diarrhea and fatigue. That, uh, yeah, it's a lot. But honestly, that wasn't too uncommon in ancient warfare. Conditions were poor. Men got sick, which is a fact of life. That's true. But some of them were getting uh, strange bumps. Yeah, see, the lesions, that's the problem. On their bodies as well. Anyway, after the looting was completed, (laughs) the men started the long trek home. Uh Uh-huh. News was brought to Marcus that the war was all but won. Right. Varus took the title of Parthicus Maximus. All right. Yep. In 166 CE, the Roman army returned east to take Medea. This was a small territory in the uh, northwestern modern uh, in northwestern modern Iran. Okay. Me. <laughs> After a quick victory, Varus took the title of Medicus. This victory can be largely chalked up to the skill of the generals who had led. Uh, this would include Avidius Cassius, the leading general of the war. Uh, Varus oversaw everything and kept the supply lines up. His presence near the front likely helped the morale of the men. Right. And made it easier to ensure that Marcus's uh, instructions were being followed. Mm-hmm. But Varus was not Hadrian. He was not Trajan. He wasn't Domitian. Uh, he was a partier who also got his work done. Nevertheless, the war was won, and Varus headed back to Rome. It was also in 166 CE that Marcus did something no emperor had done in several generations. He named his biological sons as oh, his heirs. Nice. Commodus and Aeneas, yes. who would have been five and three, Two respectively. Two boys that are left. Yep. So you can go ahead and put boxes around them. Oh, they will be our, our next best to have two heirs, given the number of children who have not survived. Yeah, uh, we don't actually know when another of Marcus's children was born. So I'm going to say that Hadrianus was born in 166. Hadrianus. Yep. Right after his brothers were made co-heirs. Uh, now, throughout Varus's years in the east, Marcus has, had held down the fort in the west. He governed well, as one would expect from uh-huh. such a learned man. But bad news was always followed by more bad news. Right. As mentioned, many legions had been pulled from the border to assist against the Parthians. Mm-hmm. This left the Rhine and the Danube regions vulnerable. Good. Let's get another attack going. Well, further east, nomadic tribes had been harassing those who lived just across from the Roman oh, territory, yeah. forcing many nomadic tribes to move west. Mm. These aggressive tribes were known as the Goths. <gasps> it was around this time that the Great Migrations began. Oh. This was a period where many peoples began moving west in vast numbers due to many factors, including war, famine, and disease. Good. Bring the disease with you. I like it. This fighting was slowly pushing many tribes westward into Roman lands. And it says something that these people felt it was the best course of action to avoid the Goths and take on the Romans. Yeah. These people were terrified, or they would not have done something so bold and reckless. Some tribes uh, had reached out diplomatically and requested sanctuary. Right. You know, settle us on Roman land and we'll supply you with troops, Mm -hmm. usually cavalry, because that's what the Romans lacked, or archers. Mm -hmm. This was a fairly standard practice by Marcus's time, uh, and he did allow some tribes in. um, But the flow was becoming too much. It used to be very small, scattered tribes. Now it was full peoples, Mm -hmm. entire cultures asking for permission. And then some stopped asking for permission. And just started moving in. So by 162, raids were becoming a serious issue. And it was in this year that the Chatai attempted mm. their first invasion of Upper Germany. 
This attack was repulsed, but it helped show the other tribes just how weak the frontier had become. Wow, it sure looks like they don't have as many troops there anymore. Yeah, right. Everyone, push in. The Marcomanni of Bohemia had been clients of the Romans for over a century. But as 166 rolled around, they joined forces with the Lombards and a smattering of other German tribes and invaded. Around the same time, the Sarmatians crossed the Danube and started causing troubles of their own. My God. In fact, all along the northeastern border of the empire, various tribes were committing near constant assaults against the weakened legions. As troops shuffled back from the east, they were quickly redeployed along the frontier. Local govern- governors were able to push back the initial waves of incursion. At first, this was not a highly coordinated attack. Peace was found with a handful of tribes around 167, followed almost immediately by the evasion of Dacia by Vandals and Sarmatians. <laughs> there, the troops were unable to hold back the tide. The Roman governor was killed by the barbarians. By this point, Marcus knew an emperor needed to be at the front. Yeah, dang, this is no good. Everyone was just like, all right, time to pounce. Hey, Let's they go. look kind of weak right now. Mm-hmm. Just like the Parthian War, uh, this time uh, he felt that both emperors should go. Under good circumstances, the emperors and their reinforcements would have headed out at haste. But by 167 and into 168, the empire was burning. Duh. Not with fire. But with plague. The disease, no. Yep. The, the troops had carried back the disease from the east, mm-hmm. and now it was everywhere. We will um, discuss the plague more in Lives of the Living. We'll go into detail about it. But bear in mind that almost everything we talk about from here on is heavily influenced by the plague. Mm-hmm. Despite all these setbacks, both emperors set out, uh, spent this time ensuring Italy's defenses were secure. Should the barbarians push through, Rome must not be threatened. Right. They also raised two extra legions before finally heading off to the front. By mid-168, they arrived in Pannonia, where the Marcomanni had crossed the Danube. Uh, The Historia Augusta tells us this was enough to scare the Marcomanni back. Uh, They saw the Imperial Army, and they pinky promised they would would (laughs) not. They would behave themselves, and they would not do this again. Um, Remember, they are a client state, and they're misbehaving. Mm -hmm. That settled. The Roman, uh, the emperors wintered in Aquileia, confident the border was secure for the time being. Then, in January of 169... What a time for war. Varus became very ill. No! Did he get bumps? Did he get the plague? Maybe. Oh. Thinking at the time was that he suffered food poisoning, oh. and others have claimed it was the plague. Mm. Regardless, Emperor Varus soon died <gasps> no leaving marcus as sole ruler of an empire beset on all sides yeah for real by enemies in the forms of men famine and disease yeah, for real everywhere it's rough he, varus would have been about 38 uh he's often forgotten even by those who study roman history uh he was likely a party animal who didn't take things nearly as seriously as his brother mm-hmm. um but he helped win the parthian war which is now named after him uh, he also helped carry the load for a man who didn't really want to be emperor, right. emperor, but felt it was his duty. Marcus was devastated, as one might imagine. Uh, it didn't help then, when news arrived later that year, that his son and heir, oh, Aeneas, God. had not survived a surgery to remove a tumor under his ear. What? The thought of going under the knife 2,000 years ago, a just tumor horrifying. tumor under his ear? Let alone for a, a small child. Yeah, for real. So Aeneas is dead. All right, put Commodus in a very, very secure cage. Put him in a box. Just, just nobody, Don't let him go anywhere. Nobody touch him. Just <laughs> <laughs> We need an heir. Uh, it is around this time that Marcus began keeping a journal. Yeah. Uh, this was not a journal about the empire, per se, but rather his inner thoughts on the world in which he found himself. Oh, boy. Get into philosophy now. It was a philosophical discussion that he had with himself over the later part of his life. A meditation, if mm-hmm. you will. And today, we actually have this journal, and it is called Meditation. Super cool. It is so cool. I bought my copy for researching this. Okay, so Marcus made the trip back to Rome for Varus' funeral. Varus was quickly deified, and then Marcus headed back to the front to resume his duties as the emperor. Uh, it is likely he did not come back for his son's funeral, because coming back takes a really long yeah, time. Yeah, that was a lot of back and forth. Yeah. A lot happened in the following years. We'll cover the highlights for the sake of time. Uh, the Romans pushed back in 169. They struggled to nail down a single battle as the troops were a very loose confederation. Mm-hmm. Defeating one did not mean the others were going to fall. 
As the armies were engaged, different tribes crossed the Danube at different locations. Some of them nearly got to Athens. Uh, okay. Along the way, they arrived at Ilius. There, they burned down the Temple of the Aleutian Mysteries. Oh, no! Yes. So, armies are fighting one tribe over here, and the others just sneak in around yeah, them in a different location. Yeah, because it's all the random whole time. and just wild. As the name of this war suggests, and I don't remember if I told you this, but it is the Marcomannic War, is what this is called. <laughs> so, they were the biggest threat. Uh, they were further north and west, south of modern Denmark. Led by Balamar, the Marcomanni defeated a force of 20,000 Romans oh, at the Battle man. of Carnuntum. Uh, from there, the barbarians besieged Aquileia. Aquileia uh, was an important city in the far northeast of Italy, right by the Alps, uh, which says something. This means that for the first time since the days of the Republic, yeah, a so hostile long ago. foreign army was in Italy. Yeah. Not good. The Praetorian prefect, Titus Furius Victorinus, led an army to relieve the city. This force was defeated, and Furious may have been killed. But his name! I know. It's like Victoria's in it! But he, he did, you know, he survived the Parthian War, and that was Victorious. Dang. Right? Disappointed. Yeah. Other sources claim he fell victim to the plague. That's so, probably pretty fair. Yeah, unclear. Uh, there is no solid consensus about when the great German invasion of Italy actually took place. It was sometime between 167 and 170, likely 168, but it's unclear. Regardless of when, this required Marcus to change strategy. As in the Parthian War, troops were pulled from across the empire to fight mm -hmm. Malamar. Claudius Pompeianus led the troops uh, with a man called Pertinax at his side. You just made a squinting face. I did. Okay. Pertinax is a familiar name for some reason. It sure is. <laughs> While he continued campaigning in 170, Marcus and Faustina had their final child. My God. Sabina. Sabina. Oh, uh. Uh, and th this is the I'm final use child. A y for fun. Okay, this like uh, is the final child that we know of. There might have been more, which is crazy. The final we know of what uh, one? What did you say? One sixty-eight. So we're at when this child. Oh, uh, this was one seventy. One seventy. Yep. <laughs> so uh, so go ahead. Give give us a count of how many children. What is uh, three six nine? 12, good old 14. 14 children. She pushed them out. Good yeah. for her. How many are alive? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Half. Hey, 50-50. Pretty good for those times. I Except you usually have like three or four, you know, not 14. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, I will just let you know, we are officially done with Marcus's children dying before him. Oh, perfect. Woo! Wow. I mean, good for them. Yeah. That's crazy. I'm surprised she didn't die in childbirth ever. Right. That's just wild. Just insane. And uh, so you, you already mentioned it, though. How many boys do we have left? Uh, we got Commodus. That's it. <laughs> okay. So Commodus is the last male alive. Mm -hmm. Half the children are dead. It's 170. Yep. Marcus is getting a bit older. Yes, yes. Uh, death and destruction literally everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, where do you think the 10-year-old Commodus was around this time? Well, I imagine he'd just be in the capital, in the palace, safe and sound. One would getting educated really help, and right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's on the front line with Marcus, obviously. Yes. Oh my God. He's Not necessarily nine. the front line, but he is at headquarters. Dude's nine with his father. Dude. <laughs> yep. So by 171, Aquileia was relieved. Okay. Soon, the Marcomanni were pushed back into their territory once again. Well, I guess I guess there's one thought. Yeah, you start him young. He's like, listen, we'll get you're my that. only heir. You got to start it. You get right. educated. <laughs> Don't be like me. Yeah. Don't be like me. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about that. But that is exactly it. So the Marcomanni are pushed back. In 172, the legions had built up a small uh, small alliances with the Germans in various mm -hmm. tribes and leveraged those for an incursion into Marcomannic territory. Soon, the most dangerous tribe was defeated and subdued. Nice. And it was at this point that Marcus took the name Germanicus. There you go. As did Commodus. Okay. Yep. In 173, the Quadi were the new focus. As many tribes were doing at this time, they had broken their treaties with the Romans to help some other tribes that right. were warring with the empire. Uh, it was during this campaign that we get a famous story of the time. During a battle with the Quadi, the Romans found themselves outpositioned and outnumbered. Fighting was fierce as the Romans kept their shields interlocked and prevented the barbarians from breaching their defenses. Nice. The barbarians uh, soon stopped fighting and encircled the legionaries. The sun was baking the earth around them. 
The men likewise baked in their armor, unable to break rank and risk being overrun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Quadi assumed that the Romans' thirst would win the day. I'll let Dio finish the rest. Quote, The Romans were in a terrible plight from fatigue, wounds, the heat of the sun, and thirst, and so could neither fight nor retreat, but were standing in line when suddenly many clouds gathered and a mighty rain, nice. not without divine interposition, That's right. burst upon them. Hell yeah. The gods had opened up the sky to save their warriors. God, that would give you such motivation. Right. Oh my God, these soldiers are thinking, we're blessed. We are blessed by the gods. Exactly. We're going to kill you all. And they did. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the Romans were able to drink up and mount a counterattack against the be bewildered barbarians. Yeah. Uh, this became known as the miracle of the rain. Yeah, that's fair. Meanwhile, along the Rhine frontier, the Chatai decided to give it the good old college try. <laughs> Just, let's, we can do it. Yeah, let's try again. And invade Germania. Oh, my the God. The Romans, part of it anyway. Yeah. The commander there was a man named Didius Julianus. A.K. Just seeing if you recognize that. He yeah. pushed back the assault and secured the northeastern border. Mm -hmm. Good job, Didius. In 174, the Quadi were fed up with their pro-Roman king. Remember, we just oh, beat them. Oh, my God. And so deposed and replaced him. How many times was I teach you this lesson, old man? I have that somewhere in here. <laughs> I have that somewhere in here. It's not in this part, but that, yeah. It still fits. Yes. Uh, I, once we get there, I'll let you know. So it didn't work out well for them. Uh, by the end of the year, Marcus's armies had fully subjugated the tribe. Mm -hmm. uh, to keep the trend of one tribe per year, in 175, Marcus focused his men on the Sarmatians. In quick order, the tribe was subdued. The treaty uh, called for the return of 100,000 Roman prisoners. Dang. Which gives you an idea of the scale. Yeah, that's wild. This. Marcus then took the title of Sarmaticus. Mm -hmm. For those keeping track, Marcus <laughs> has now been fighting these Germanic tribes from 167 to 175. Yeah, no, it went from just all the peace to everyone being like, all right, it's time. Time to go. Everyone that's on a border with Rome, let's go. Yep. <laughs> Pretty much everywhere that there is a threat, they are attacking. Yep. In, you know, from the Parthians to every tribe yeah. <laughs> northeast of Rome. Well, they tried it. Let's just give it a shot. Let's just know? see how it goes. God. Eight years of fighting, dozens of invaders across hundreds of miles have borders. But finally, it looked like Marcus was in position to push in and establish a couple new provinces. Wow. Like the good old days of Trajan and Augustus. Yeah. <laughs> the good I mean, days. if you're fighting for eight years straight, you might as well get something out of it. However, these plans were cut before they could even begin. A new emperor had been declared in the east. Are you serious right now? We mentioned Davidius Cassius before. Yeah. He had led the Roman armies against Tessaphon and then sacked Seleucia uh, when they opened their doors. Obviously, such stunning victories had earned the general a lot of renown. Yeah, okay. Back in 170, he had been granted the title of Supreme Commander of the Orient, the Orient being the east. Uh, this gave him Imperium over the east so this would be the closest a person could be to being emperor mm. without being emperor mm. this power was given to him due to a revolt in egypt known as the bucolic war and we won't go into that right now Perfect. because there's just too much war yeah. <laughs> suffice it to say uh cassius's military competence was on display once again mm -hmm. and he had the revolt put down by 175 however word soon arrived to cassius emperor marcus aurelius was dead <gasps> wait the it was a lie. It would what? seem the plague or some other illness had suddenly taken him. The truth, however, was that Marcus was alive, though very unwell. Mm -hmm. It is unclear how this confusion came about. Some sources claim it was Marcus's wife, Faustina, who attempted to either trick or persuade Cassius to revolt. Oh, no. This is the story we will go with, but remember, it might not be true. The loyal wife? Faustina was fearful as any mother who has lost literally half her children would yeah. be. Uh, her son Commodus was the heir, mm -hmm. yet he was still around 13 years old, yeah. and the world was dying around them. Sure was. Plague and war had been their reality for most of Commodus's life. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he would have just grown up in a living hell. Yes. Marcus had been gone for most of the hardship as well. And now, with Marcus ill and far away at war... Faustina feared she and her children would be overthrown should Marcus die. Mm. So, either she sent the letter to Cassius lying about Marcus's death, or she heard Cassius plan to revolt as a result of Marcus's death and encouraged him to do so. This would mean having a secure military leader as emperor and avoid the bloody mess of a military takeover by one of the other distinguished generals. Fearing the reaction of the troops, Marcus did not initially tell them 
of the revolt. Oh, we're fighting another I war mean, that's right true. now. Got to keep your eye on the prize here. Exactly. But rumors always spread. Yeah. Uh, and soon he was forced to make a speech. Dio gives us this speech, though it is likely an original piece written by Dio to represent Marcus's actual words. I would read some of it, but the script is quite long, so we'll say it was a good speech. Nice. Essentially, he would be willing to hand the reins of power over to Cassius if he could do so with the Senate and Army's support. Mm. Uh, he also hoped that Cassius would not be killed should he fail in his usurpation. He liked Cassius. Nice. Marcus like, listen, man, that's fine. I can retire. Just let's chill for a second. <laughs> Yeah, except that the, the Senate didn't agree. Of course uh, they didn't. Cassius they set up, had set up in Egypt, unsure how to proceed once he learned that Marcus was, in fact, alive. Uh, yeah, I suppose it's a little awkward for him. And by this point, there really isn't any going back. Yeah. Yeah, especially <laughs> when troops start declaring for you and provinces start yeah. declaring for you. Uh, the Senate had also declared him an enemy of the state. Uh. With so much turmoil, uh, Rome soon fell into panic. Most of the West was staunchly in support of Marcus. Mm -hmm. Uh, some would declare for Cassius, should he get that far, but not many. Still, a legion was forced to go into the city to put down unrest caused by fear. Not, not to mention the city was in really rough shape by this point due to the plague. Mm -hmm. like, really bad. So everything just looked like it was falling apart, and now there's a revolt. Something had to be done, and, and violence ensued. Marcus was forced to end his planned assaults on the barbarians. Peace deals were quickly signed. Uh, by this time, most of the barbarians simply wanted the fighting to end. Yeah. So did the Romans like stop? All just right. Quit. Just God. This was bittersweet. It meant that they could f uh, that they would not finish what they started, mm -hmm. but it also meant that they now outnumbered Cassius by a good bit. Yeah. None of that mattered though. A few months into the rebellion, Cassius was murdered. Oh. The soldiers heard Marcus planned to invade Egypt and wanted no part of it. Egypt and the other eastern provinces that had declared for Cassius soon fell in line. The severed head of Cassius was sent to Marcus, uh, a man, like I said, he considered a friend. Yeah, he's like, ah. Marcus refused to look at the head and immediately ordered its burial. Seeing that the West was as secure as it had been in years and seeing how insecure the East clearly was, Marcus planned a visit to Egypt to ensure everyone was in line. Uh, however, in the winter of 175 CE, Faustina suddenly died. No! Theories abound about how she, how and why she had died. It may have been suicide. If the sources can be trusted, she had tempted a man to overthrow her devoted husband. Mm -hmm. uh, it may have been poison for this very same reason. Right. Uh, it could also have been illness or the plague. No one knows for sure. What we do know is that Marcus was naturally crushed. Yeah. He set up a set of schools for orphaned girls that he called the Girls of Faustina. Nice. Uh, this poor dude could not catch a break. Classy. Nah, he's just been surrounded by death and hardship for just his entire and the entire reign <laughs> yeah and like i mean he had some children die during antoninus's reign yep. which was bad but then just like as soon as he took over just everything <laughs> but we'll talk about that later as a determined stoic that he was uh he set about his work once again um this was the path the universe had set him upon and damn it he would follow it uh he did take a trip out to athens with commodus there they were initiated into the Eleusian mysteries nice a, tr a tradition at this point uh i'm not sure if the timeline is confused because we said that that temple got burned down like seven years ago right or if they rebuilt i don't know but, but i mean yeah maybe they could have just rebuilt it or just still we'll, did we'll it, it without this temple the over building here. Yeah, yeah you know <laughs> around the same time oh and i i forgot I left this part out, but as I was researching the next episode, I remembered I didn't put this in here. They did go to the eastern provinces and traveled around for ah, a bit. Not no. as long as Hadrian, but they Show up it. and be like, hey guys, come on now. <laughs> I'm in charge. Yep. Remember that. It's me. Uh, around this same time, in 176, shortly after getting back, Marcus made another bold choice. He declared his son joint emperor. Oh, boy. Obviously, this was a junior role. Yeah. Uh, even more so than Varus's position beneath Marcus. Commodus was also made consul at this time, and he would have been 15. Yeah, I was like, this is it's a child. The youngest consul in history to that point. Mm -hmm. The regular age requirement was 30. Oh, dang. Yeah. It was clear Marcus feared for the succession, uh, which makes sense. Death and destruction were all they had known. Uh, he hoped to solidify his son's position as heir firmly in the eyes of both the army and the Senate. So mm -hmm. show him off. Make him joint heir or joint emperor so that when I die, there's no question about yeah. who's in charge. Yeah. The fighting in Germany never really stopped, just slowed down a bit between 175 and 76. By 177, the second Marcomannic War kicked oh off. Oh, my God. Those damn quad I had rebelled once again. 
Uh, how many times do we have to teach you this lesson, old man? I knew it it was that (laughs) army. (laughs) Yep. Marcus returned uh, to his post at the frontier, this time to end it. Mm -hmm. In 178, the Marco Mani were targeted once again. Uh, As before, they were crushed within the year. Next came the Quadi, who would take the better part of 179 and the beginning of 180 to put down. Victory was fast approaching. One of the Praetorian prefects caught up with the fleeing Quadi and claimed a decisive victory. The war was all but won. Nice. Then, on March 17th, 180 CE, Marcus Aurelius died. No. He was 58 years old. How old's Commodus? One, well, you said 180? Yep. Okay. All right. He's 19. He is 19. Okay. Uh, yeah. So what do you think? <laughs> what? <sighs> yeah. so sa- oh, God. What a poor man. <laughs> what a poor, poor man. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes. And, and consider uh well again we'll go into this more but like consider if someone less capable had been in his yeah for real like wow he held that together with duct tape and super glue yeah Yeah. (laughs) and all the stoic willpower he had (laughs) yeah he was just like well life sucks i guess i just gotta carry on (laughs) all right let's get into the first round mastery of military might we covered most of his military experience in the biography like trajan the wars are the central piece of his story more mm-hmm. so than Trajan because it was constant. He was yes. almost always fighting. Uh-huh. A quick summary. He had zero military experience when coming to the purple around age 40. His life had been spent growing up during two of the most peaceful reigns in the history of the empire. Uh, because of this long-standing peace in the empire, he inherited a military force that had spent two decades without serious real-world experience. Lazy. Yep. The Jewish revolt under Hadrian was the last time mm-hmm. the, there had been a real threat, and that was bef- well before Marcus. Immediately, once taking the purple, the largest external threat to the empire launched a mass assault on their eastern front. Heavy early uh, setbacks led Marcus and the Senate to conclude that an emperor needed to go. Varus was chosen. And over the next few years, the commanders of the east managed to defeat their longtime rival and sack their capital once again. And Marcus would have been overseeing this all from Rome, personally instructing affairs when necessary. The army was depleted by the five years of fighting, but more so by the plague that they brought back with them. Yeah. Again, we'll look at that later. But there was no time to worry about some pesky plague. They needed troops out defending the Danube and ride frontiers. Mass invasion by dozens of tribes kicked off and would consume the remainder of Marcus's disappointingly short life. Marcus moved to the front to command his armies. He spent eight years away from Rome in one long stretch where he did not come back. He understood his lack of military experience had been a hindrance, so... uh, First off, he had educated himself extensively. Yeah. And then he brought his young son and heir to the front with him so that he could learn as much as possible before the very likely event Mm -hmm. that Marcus died. He was sickly through most of his later life. In total, he spent around 14 years fighting the tribes of the Northeast. This is a vast majority of his reign, which was 19 years. Dang. The first five years had been spent overseeing Varus's campaigns. Mm -hmm. So literally the whole reign. In the face of constant loss, betrayal, incursion, and war, he managed to hold his empire together. Uh, He learned the skills necessary to lead massive war efforts that put great strain on an empire at its breaking point. And in all this, he was as successful as one could hope, given the circumstances. Yeah. I Wild. You know, I, I don't like giving out tens easily, but I just can't. He won every war. Despite being on the back foot almost the whole time, he fought for 19 years, starting with zero experience. Mm-hmm. I, I'm going to give him a 10. Man, just like that. Just so, like. I'm also apprehensive. Why? About a 10. Why? I was thinking appreh- probably like the first half of that was probably. I mean, he was there and involved, but like, who are my best generals? Please take care of this and. And I'll learn from you. Right. Well, I will say, if um, if it was the generals truly doing most of it, obviously they're the ones leading it personally, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. one would imagine that given the weakened state of the empire, one of those generals would have taken over if it was truly, Potentially. truly out of Marcus's hands. Um, and I just, I just can't. If, if you give Trajan uh, a 10 for you know, winning a few wars against some barbarians who weren't that big a threat and beating the Parthians. Well, Marcus did that and then some by quite a bit. He just happened to be doing it defensively for most of it. Yeah. But then when he when he saw an opportunity, he went on the offensive. 
And when there was a need to shift troops to ensure that wherever was the weakest was reinforced, he did it constantly. I'm a, I'm a big fan. We'll give it to him. Yeah, <laughs> let's go. We'll give it to him. Yes. All right, so that is a perfect 20 for Mastery of Military Might for our boy Marcus, and on to the next. Terrible tyranny. You might be shocked to learn that there is very little to be said about Marcus Aurelius' terrible or tyrannical side. He was side. very occupied. That, and he was a soft-spoken stoic. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like, uh, he, he was a soft-spoken stoic philosopher mm-hmm. who would probably kindly correct me that he was not a philosopher, uh, <laughs> merely a student. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is a blight we can discuss, and that is the Christians. We've had issues with the Christians since Trajan's episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nero even had a bit to do with them. Uh, but we are nearly two centuries removed from Jesus. The mm-hmm. sect has grown and spread. They're still a very, very tiny minority, uh, but large enough to make the emperors and governors take notice. Yeah. Under Trajan, Pliny the Younger had requested guidance on what to do with the Christians who would not repent uh, who would not show uh, 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 do sacrifices and stuff mm, for the emperor. Mm, mm-hmm. Christianity was strictly outlawed. As Gregory Hayes puts it in his edition of Meditations, quote, their refusal to accept any god but their own and their reluctance to acknowledge the divine status of the emperor threatened the social order and the well-being of the state. Yeah. Trajan had advised that if Christians practiced their faith in private and did their necessary service to the imperial cult, i.e., if they just act like everyone else right. and just accept that there are multiple gods and pretend like their god is mm-hmm. their own thing on mm-hmm. their own, leave them alone. Uh, this policy was essentially passed down through the next three emperors, but one can imagine that the multiple Jewish revolts under Trajan and Hadrian uh, didn't help the image of monotheistics. Nope. This small Christian cult certainly looked like a new threat. Christians were also viewed poorly by the intellectuals of the time, including our good friend Fronto. Uh, another of Marcus's friends and mentors was Junius Rusticus, Uh, He was the city prefect in Rome. It was there that he ordered the execution of several Christians, one of whom was named Justin Martyr. Oh, I wonder if that's where the term comes from. (laughs) Right. (laughs) This man had spent a lot of time trying to get Antoninus to end the persecution of Christians. Mm. But in 165 CE, Rusticus had him beheaded for failing to perform sacrifices for the emperor. I don't think that's going to go well. No. He was also the one that claimed the miracle of the rain was the result of Christians praying nearby. And to clarify, Justin Martyr was, not Rusticus. Right. So that uh, whole miracle was actually because some Christians were praying for the emperor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Marcus did not overtly push the persecution of Christians. Uh, Like his predecessors, he let governors and local officials handle the sect as they saw fit. That said, he did not seek to stop the persecution. Yeah. As we said, Christians truly were a threat to the way of life of the emperor, uh, and it will go on to cause major upheavals for centuries to come. Yes, it's it will. It's a very troubling yes, system of religion that they saw as a problem, and they were correct. Still, the state's policy of executing Christians for refusal to break with their faith is terrible. To sum things up, my book, All About Terrible Things Emperors Did, <laughs> has this to say about Marcus. Quote, Marcus Aurelius was to make only one real contribution to Rome's, quote, darker history. But that contribution was to be a big one. He named his son Commodus as his successor. Spoilers, oh. sorry. <laughs> um, okay. I, okay. Yeah, we can't, really, we can't really give him points for that, but there were signs that uh, Commodus might not be the guy to do it. Ah, I see. Maybe, maybe he's not fit for the job maybe well, hey marcus you know how you know how everyone that's been emperor for the last 80 years has been adopted and it's yeah. been working great has been like a, hmm. a a good candidate to be emperor and then they're like yeah right. i'll adopt you you can do hey 19 year old yeah he really he really really okay really wanted that biological heir he sure did well so <laughs> this is something i didn't write but just something to bear in mind and i'll give credit to the totalis rankium guys for bringing this point up at this point Marcus's choices are essentially let Commodus be the heir Mm -hmm. or kill Commodus. Pretty much, yeah, because Commodus would probably not be okay with someone else being adopted and made emperor. So, So, and you can't imagine that a man who's lost seven children is going to execute his last son. He would not even, and 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 Marcus wouldn't. Yeah, even if he hadn't lost all all those kids, you wouldn't. Right. So, we'll leave that there because we're going to talk about Commodus next Mm -hmm. week. But, 
terrible tyranny. We've got the the Christians. One. You think one? One. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I guess uh, I just didn't want. I just didn't want to do zero. Right. I think. No. I, I mean, think. Yeah. I think he yeah. deserves something. It is terrible what happened to the Christians. And so you give him a one. Yeah. I'm gonna give him a two. Wow. Because I know the signs that he should have seen. With yeah. Thomas. <laughs> well, he didn't. <laughs> yeah, clearly. <laughs> he was but, like, I'm a sickly, very tired, very <laughs> occupied man just trying to show this child. He's there. He's there. Just shut up. He's there. Yeah, for real. He's my only son. Just he's he's got it. <laughs> yeah, just just settle down. All right. So that is a three for terrible tyranny, which I think is Probably more than enough. Yeah. <laughs> and is it the lowest? I would imagine. It just oh is there a tied? four? Oh, there's a three too. I yeah, guess there's a four. I gave, for I, gave, I gave someone a, a two and you gave someone a one, right? Trajan. We flipped. Yeah. Yep. So Vespasian has a four and yeah. Trajan is tied for three for the least terrible. Yeah. Which is pretty good. So on to the next. Lives of the living. Oh no. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the Antonine Plague. Yeah. So it's important we understand the significance of this. It is known as the Antonine Plague because Marcus was of the Antonine Dynasty. Gotcha. It is also known as the Plague of Galen. Galen was the imperial doctor. He oh, cared for Commodus okay. and the other children when they were young. He also took detailed records of the plague, which have survived. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's so cool. It is. It's really cool. So as we discussed, during the campaign of the East, the men started getting sick mm -hmm. near the enemy capital. By 166, it was spreading It was spreading across all the camps. Yeah. And as victory was secured, the men were rushed back to Gaul mm -hmm. to secure the northeast border, and the disease spread at an expedited rate. Rome itself was soon ravaged yeah. by the plague. The Eternal City and its one million inhabitants <sighs> quickly found themselves living in some sort of hell. Galen describes the common symptoms as, quote, Fever, diarrhea, and inflammation of the pharynx, along with dry or pustule eruptions of the skin after nine days. Oh, no. This plague would be the first pandemic the empire ever faced. Epidemic would be large outbreaks in specific regions. Pandemic meant it was everywhere. Yeah. Including, possibly, China. Huh. Similar outbreaks were occurring in China, suggesting the trade across the Silk Road, though limited and indirect, was helping the disease to spread great distances. Virtually every major city and military encampment was hit hard. There was significant concern at the beginning of the Marcomannic Wars that the army was going to be too depleted to even put up a fight. Fortunately, plagues don't choose sides. Yeah, right? The barbarian tribes and the Parthians were also devastated. It is also likely that Varus died from this plague, and maybe Fronto, mm -hmm. uh, leaving Marcus to bear the weight of the empire alone, and Marcus may also have died mm -hmm. from the plague. The plague lasted almost exactly as long as Marcus did. Cool. After 15 years of war and plague, both seemed to be at an end, and then Marcus died. My God. Estimates on the death toll in the empire vary wildly. Uh, anywhere from 1.5 to 25 million deaths. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you weren't lying. That's pretty wide. In the empire alone. Yeah. That's anywhere from 2 to 33% of the empire's population. Dang. Upwards of a third of the people died. <laughs> and the empire made up a sizable portion of mm -hmm. the world's population at yeah, this time. Yeah, for sure. All gone 15 years. There are two theories on what the plague was. You want to take a guess? What'd you say? You said fever, diarrhea... Inflamed pharynx and lesions. Some sort of, uh, some sort of pox, smallpox, but very, very, very old version of it. Yeah. So it could have been Nailed measles. It. The other option is measles, but that's the less yeah. likely. It's believed measles solved several hundred years later, mm -hmm. and then smallpox is the primary candidate. So well done. Did and if it. it if it was smallpox, we can infer. That the mortality rate would have been higher, right? The higher yeah, because that was it was not fun. Yeah, we know a lot about smallpox. So, all that to be bore in mind. Let's now begin Marx's actual lives of the living, things mm -hmm. he was doing. Mm -hmm. So the empire was under attack for nearly two decades. Yep. Despite this, the enemies never managed to get in too far. Hadrian's preparations were paying off, along with Marx's planning and ability to choose good men to lead. The war was constant. Most people in the empire were safe and secure. Mm -hmm. They didn't get very far. It was just constant fighting. The empire remained prosperous. Hadrian and Pius had left the empire in good standing financially, which is 
Very good. Marcus was able to leverage this and to handle all the massive issues that befell him. That massive flood we talked about earlier occurred very early and caused a famine and a lot of property damage. And if not for the plague, the average person would have been doing quite well Mm -hmm. under Marcus. Mm -hmm. He was handling things as well as one could. Marcus also expanded upon the orphan support system set up by Trajan and expanded upon by each emperor since. These orphans must have been living in luxury by this point. Yeah. He was a generous man. He did not hoard wealth as many did. When it was clear that his finances were secure, he gave his inheritance from a family member to his sister. Hmm. Marcus was very well prepared for the administrative and legal duties of the office. He'd spent 20 years working alongside Antoninus. Mm -hmm. He was well respected for his knowledge of the law. Before being pulled away for years of war, he spent a lot of time hearing cases and administering justice. He is said to have been fair and merciful in his judgments, quote, generous in rewarding and mild in granting pardon. A few other quotes from the Historia Augusta that just attest to him. He prohibited prohibited libels on the part of informers, the mark of infamy being placed on false accusers. Mm. So don't come and lie to me about something someone did or you will be punished. He limited uh, gladiatorial spectacles in every way. The streets of the city, too, and the highways he maintained with the greatest care. So those are all quotes from the Historia Augusta. He raised the silver content of the denarius from 79 to 82%. Nice. But like those before him, a couple of years later, he needed to yeah. lower it again get due to all the military back. spending. Yeah. <laughs> you get this picture of one of the best leaders you could have had during a time of peace. <laughs> but he was forced to be at war throughout. Yeah. And meanwhile, all his loved ones were dying around him. Mm -hmm. A very tragic what could have been, including when he died. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, it was all maybe settling down. And then you died. Mm -hmm. But he did remarkably well for someone who wasn't ready for war and plague and everything. The cons. The plague. Unfortunately, there was virtually nothing Marcus could do about it. They didn't understand germs. There was no treatment. Nothing they could do to fix it and nothing he did to cause it. Right. Yep. The wars. Could do something about this. And he did a lot. Mm Mm-hmm. The Christians were being persecuted, more so than before, possibly because everyone was miserable. And when everyone's miserable, they find scapegoats. So that's really it. It's tough because the lives of the living were greatly diminished, really through no fault of his own, and kind of in spite of his like good efforts to keep things good. Yeah, it's hard to discredit him for the plague. It's hard to really let it do too much. Mm -hmm. But the lives of the living were... So, like, we have perfect scores under Trajan and Hadrian. I know. And probably would have under Pius. So I don't think we can do that here. No, I was was thinking somewhere around a 7 or 8. I was also thinking 6 or 7. because... Just because everything's burning. It sucked, man. It sucked (laughs) a lot, but you're doing what you can. He did great, but there was just only so much he could do. Right. Hmm. So what do you... I'm going to give him a 7, then. Okay. Um, Should I go 6 or 7... You came down from your eight, so I I'm going to I'm gonna go seven. All right. So a 14 for lives of the living. About as good as one could expect from 20 years of war. I would say better. Better th- than you would expect right. from a he plague did, in 20 years of war. That. Yeah. He earned it pretty darn hard. So on to the next. Departing Demise. For the first time in this show... I don't really have anything interesting to say about Marcus's death. Man got sick and died. He was a sickly man in his late 50s. Over a decade spent on the front getting mm-hmm. letter after letter that your children are dead. <laughs> hey, man, this guy died. Uh, this one died. Hey, yeah, your wife's okay. dead. Hey, uh. your friend betrayed you. Hey, everyone's dead. Yeah. He can do a lot to a person. Uh, then he died. There yeah. is no known cause. It could have been the plague, old age, or some other illness. Um, he died very suddenly, though. Mm-hmm. And he had reigned for almost exactly 19 years. Yeah, not really that interesting. No. Nope. Like, there wasn't a twist. There wasn't a story. The only thing interesting is that, you know, he left Commodus as his heir. And he died suddenly. <laughs> so, unfortunately, there's a few. He's going to get kind of a weak score for interesting, despite yes. it being really interesting. He's going to get some mid-tier scores here. Yep. Uh, so, departing demise, I mean, I really, I really can't give him much. Maybe a... Um, one or two. Man. Unfortunately, I'm really sad about it, but I'm clawing at it. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna give him a. I'm gonna give him a three, and I'm gonna just, just spin the tail of he had fought his whole his whole time in charge, and as soon as it finally started coming to an end, Ugh. he died. Just dropped. Okay, okay. You you spun that a little. I was <laughs> gonna say because you gave Hadrian a, a three. Yeah. I gave him a seven. Yeah. 
Hmm. So you're going to go three. I am. Because he... I, that is kind of funny. I guess I could have spun it that way. Like, here we yeah. are. <laughs> we did it. We're. It's finally... The clouds yeah. are lift. Ugh. Yeah, finally. It looks Just, like the life of terror is coming to an end. <laughs> all right, all right. You give him a three... I'll give him a three, two. Yes. I was going to give him a one. There we go. I but know you, you said you, one or you two. You convinced and like, <gasps> me. Yeah. Yep. Thank you for stopping that atrocity Welcome. from taking place. And our last round with the score. Lasting legacy. Marcus Aurelius is a very interesting case for legacy. Mm-hmm. He is known as the philosopher emperor. Yeah. Oh, that's fitting. Makes sense. Many have probably read his meditations or even quotes that they've seen online and have no idea who he was. Or if they do, he's just that emperor guy who wrote some cool stuff. Mm -hmm. We also may have the oldest love letters, yeah, which would also be the oldest gay love letters, Mm -hmm. which is very neat, between himself and Fronto. He's stamped down on gladiatorial games. This, along with later Christianization, would lead to the end of gladiatorial combat entirely, Yeah, which is a massive change in in their culture. Right, social, yeah, how they Mm -hmm. socially did everything. This is also the true beginning of the age of barbarian invasion. Mm. Domitian had been the first to really feel it. Yeah. 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 But now it's like, oh God, they just keep coming. That's they right. Yeah. Because all these coming. tribes just keep being like, oh, I'll help you. No, I'll help. Yeah, I'll help you too. Yeah. Yep. Like, and yeah, here we let's come just to, keep poking them. Yep. Just keep, keep going. Them. And they're, they're fleeing mm-hmm. from something horrible. Yeah. There is also a plague named after himself and his family. Yeah. A very important plague that affected the world in ways that are kind of hard to right. really quantify. Yeah. But a lot. It was, it was a massive impact. He was the first emperor to raise another as his co-emperor. Mm-hmm. It takes a while for this to fully take effect, but two emperors will eventually become the norm. Nice. He also did it twice. First with Varys yeah. and then with Commodus. Yeah. He is the last of the five good emperors, mm. or four, if you believe me. This is also considered the end of the Golden Age. Yeah, I was going to say, let's start the chaos. When you said uh, a general in the East, I was like... I can see the line starting to form. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> we're not there yet. I know. And we're not there yet. He was, because, and again, all these things where it's like, oh, it could have all crumbled, mm-hmm. but he didn't let it. Yeah. It could be said that the empire peaked under Antoninus. Yeah. That would be the peak of the Golden Age, and everything else is a slow downhill from here. That's fair. There will be peaks going up, yeah. but they will never get never to get that back. height again. Yeah. Mm-mm. His death would also kind of be the end of the Pax Romana, the Roman yeah. peace we've had since yeah. Augustus. Well, uh, we have a little bit longer before that actually ends, but this is basically where it ends. As an aside, just because I found this very interesting and I went off on a tangent, there is also a record around 166 okay. of a diplomatic envoy to the Chinese emperor. Ooh. The envoy claimed to have come from the court of Marcus Aurelius. Cool. We hear this from an entry in the book of the later Han. This was a Chinese history compiled in the 400s, which would be centuries after this supposed yeah, meeting. Yeah, yeah. It is possible that Marcus had sent the first envoy from the Roman state to the distant and almost mythical Chinese state. Oh, that's so cool. It is. It's like, oh my God, because they like... They would. They barely knew about each other. I actually yeah. looked into this a bit. They had a name mm-hmm. for for the Romans, which uh, I, I I took it out because I wanted to shorten things. But it was essentially like they named it after the first dynasty of China. Oh yeah, yeah. And they called them like the Great Version mm-hmm. of that. That's what they oh, thought of as the Romans. Cool. And so for them to show up and be like, hey, they may also just have been traders who showed up on their own volition. But mm-hmm. someone traveled from mm-hmm. Europe to China. That's insane. Yeah, that long ago, way back. Yeah, then. wild. So. I think this quote from Dio very succinctly sums up Marcus Aurelius, so I'm going to give Mm -hmm. this to you. Marcus did not meet with the good fortune that he deserved, for he was not strong in body and was involved in a multitude of troubles throughout practically his entire reign. But for my part, I admire him all the more for this very reason, that amid unusual and extraordinary difficulties, he both survived himself and preserved the empire. Just one thing prevented him from being completely happy, namely, that after rearing and educating his son in the best possible way, he was vastly disappointed in him. This matter must be our next topic, for our history now descends from a kingdom of gold to one of iron and rust, as affairs did for the Romans of that day. Oh, no. (laughs) So I would say Marcus has one of the most impactful legacies Mm -hmm. of the Roman Empire because he saved the Golden Age mm-hmm. throughout his reign and helped bring about its downfall inadvertently. Yeah. As well as his meditations that people still read yeah. today. Yeah. And just everything he did just 
threw himself into it and just kept go. I would have quit. I would quit. <laughs> I'm like, nah. By the fifth invasion, yeah. I would have just been like, <laughs> "That's true. I'm going that so home. many. <laughs> Someone else do this." <laughs> I I gotta give him a ten. Yeah, yeah, I'll give him a ten. Yes, That's no fair. questions. Let's go. So that is a, a perfect lot. ten out of ten. Twenty out of twenty. Yeah. For a lasting legacy, what do you think his score is? <sighs> Let's see. He's on both spectrums here, real high and real low. Yep. I'm gonna. Uh, is, I can't remember what the high high scores are. Oh. So eighty five oh. is point five is currently shut up <laughs> is currently our our highest score, and our okay, lowest okay. is fifty three. Dang. Yep. Uh sixty eight. Sixty three. Dang. Yeah. So it really is one of those situations where he's highly interesting for his military. Yep. He's not interesting at all for being bad. Right. Or dying. Right. And then the lives of the living. It's that one's he, a hard one because it's not so much yeah. interesting as like where was it? He did everything he could. He did so well. The yeah. world was against him. <laughs> yep. And then just his legacy really helps carry him. Yep. I don't think that's a a bad score at all for him. No, not when you look at it. He just needed he just needed a mental break in the last like five years of Kill his life. Like you know, 15 he just senators. needed a little genocide, and he oh, would have really yeah. bumped those that numbers would help a lot. up. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Marcus. Next time. Yeah. <laughs> when it rolls back around. Yeah. All right. Let's get in to our final questions. Oh man, the great. What is is he anything but the great? No, no, he is yeah, like yeah, hundred percent it. gets the great. Yeah. There's no question about it. He's one of yeah. the greatest emperors that the Roman Empire ever had for sure. And going into each emperor that I know is like famous and important, mm-hmm. I try to like look at it with a clear eye. And I'm just, the whole time I was like, my God, dude. Yeah, no, he just he you just deserve did it. this. Yeah, he did it all, man. Uh, yeah, so congratulations. Yeah, yeah. I uh, thought Marcus Aurelius is the great, and now we need to think of an epithet. And this time, oh, oh, and we 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 came up. We after Hadrian, we were we were upset because oh. we couldn't think of a good. Epithet you remember for Hadrian. it? Because yeah, I, I do. Know. Okay, that's good. So we had settled with Hadrian the Voyager, which right. neither of us was happy about. And even yeah. after the podcast, we're like, was, ah, yeah. just, that's not good. <laughs> there was uh, the restless. Yeah, there was, and we could include something with that. Do you mm-hmm. want to just do Hadrian the restless? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I think it's better than Voyager because yeah. Voyager sounds really good, except that it's very, we just couldn't get over the fact well, that it, it is it's related sea, to ships. It is. It's just like a, a seafaring na- word. But I think the restless is very fitting. Makes sense. For, for yeah. He was always, always on the move. Always, constantly. Okay. Marcus. Okay. So there, there are a lot of ways that a lot of these can go. So just be aware that most of them, you could also put stoic or philosopher at the end, mm. and they would still work. So the first one, Marcus the philosopher prince, just because it sounds really nice. It does. Marcus the stoic, Marcus the sad stoic. <laughs> but <laughs> then the, the rest, these are the ones where you could put stoic or philosopher on the end if you want. So I'm just going to give you a few here. The steadfast, the resolute, the unshakable, and the unwavering. And then you could put something after. Mm. What do you think? I like unshakable and unwavering. Mm. Yep, me too. They're very nice. I think unwavering is my preference between those yeah. two. I, I always want to try to work. I want to work in. My brain is trying to put together uh, the reluctant something. Because he just, he did such a great job. And I mean, the whole could, time was just like, I didn't, I don't want to. <laughs> I mean, he could be Marcus the reluctant. But that doesn't sound good, right, though. Because it yeah. sounds like he doesn't want it and won't do it. Yeah, it but sounds, that's, but sounds so like he's resolute. lazy or something. Resolute or steadfast would be like, it doesn't matter that I don't want to. I'm going to do yeah. it. Marcus, the unwavering. I like I like that. Do you think it needs a stoic or philosopher? The unwavering stoic? No. The unwavering no. philosopher, just the unwavering? No. Yeah, I don't think. I think that would just add. Mm-hmm. I think so, too. Like, just the slightest bit of why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Marcus the Unwavering. Yeah. All right. He just just didn't stop. He did not. Can't stop, won't stop. The world kept punching him right in the face and the nuts, and he just kept coming back. Yeah, sure did. And and he won. Yeah. And then he just died. And then he died. died. (laughs) So unfortunate. (laughs) Well, Marcus the Unwavering, thank you for what you did. Thank you for the wonderful story. I enjoy it. I researched so hard on this. I was having so Mm -hmm, much fun mm -hmm. with it. And now we get to learn about Commodus. Yeah, another little psychopath and teenage it all emperor falls down. Yeah, starts a demise now. Yep, it's gonna be real fun. Only gets worse. So excited. <laughs> 
All right. Well, thank you guys so much for listening. I, I, we, sh- we should check and see how long this one has been. Yeah, you still awake? It's a long one. You hang hey, in there. You know, it's not much longer. Is actually. it not? Actually? Hour fifty two right now. I mean, it's I the mean, longest one so far. Yeah. But not. I was expecting us to be past two hours with oh, how long okay. the script was. I did read quick on some parts. You did that was right. Yeah. Also, big shout out to our friend and listener Titian. Yes. Who uh, finally was able to get three beautiful busts of um caesar augustus and vespasian 3d printed and sent to me they're in my office now eventually i'm gonna make a great wall thing post it somewhere it's gonna be great also sent me some delicious mead so good homemade 